So we're looking at uh, chapter 2 of Baba Batra, Mishnah Gimel. It is about the laws of damage. This is what book you read before. Um, and here, here we get to an interesting uh, situation. So far, so far what we've dealt with was physical damage, either uh, uh, loosening the ground, uh, harming the wall, the water well, a uh, fire in the house, heat, humidity. Here we have a new situation. Hanut uh, um, Hatzer is what we would call today a courtyard. This was usually uh, sort of a, a closed neighborhood, uh, a square, like you could see in the old city, you know, a central court, and all the houses around the court face the, uh, uh, face the court. So this is shared space. Some people might have backyard, but there's one central yard, a courtyard, that is shared by all. And now one of the uh, one of the uh, residents wants to open a store, any type of store. So he says, "Yechol limhod beyado velomalo eni yechol lishan mikol mikol anichnasim umikol ayotzim." I cannot sleep. Because of the foot traffic, people come in, people people go out. Uh, this is not uh, um, this is not the way I want to live my life in a in a in a residential uh, area. Osekelim yotzeu mocher betoch hashuk. He makes uh, utensils. And then he takes it and he sells it in the marketplace. The Hebrew of the Mishnah is somewhat difficult uh, because it seems that this is an, an, an imperative. He should make uh, utensils and he should take them out and sell them in the marketplace. So then the word aval would would have been appropriate here that saying that the uh, the neighbor tells the, the artisan... The, this person, you cannot do it here, but that person can do it in the, cannot sell it in the in the in the courtyard, but he could make it there and take it, uh, uh, take it to the marketplace. But I think we could read it like that in in a different way. Osekelim is not an imperative; it is not a verb; it's a noun, and maybe we should put a dash here, like the osekelim, the person who makes uh, utensils. The potter or the carpet, whatever it is, yotzeu mocher betoch hashuk. If you are, if you happen to live there and you're a, a, um, an artisan and you don't have another uh, studio, you could do that and go and sell it in the marketplace. Aval and no yacholim hot beyado velomalo and ni yachol lishan lo mikol apatish velo mikol arichaim velo mikol atinokod this this phrase created a lot of confusion in the talmud trying to figure out what is happening here which tinokot are we talking about the uh, because what it says is this it, it, he says i cannot sleep because of the the foot traffic and we're not talking about sleeping at night right this is daytime because obviously you're not going to run your store at night um, but the uh, but the the neighbor could say I cannot sleep. He cannot. Sorry, he's not entitled to uh, to to say that he is bothered by the sound of the hammer, by the sound of the millstone, or by the sound of the children. Tinokot. What is tinokot? That's in modern Hebrew. Babies. babies. Right. Babies is in modern Hebrew. But in uh, uh, in Mishnaic Hebrew, it's teenagers. Tinok could be anywhere, actually, from seven, eight years old to sixteen, which I believe a lot of uh, parents of teenagers would say, "Yeah, they're babies." So it's the same thing. Um, no, it's, it's tipshim, right? What? Teenagers in modern Hebrew is tipshim. Uh, no, they call him Tipesh Esre, yes. That's what it is. There's T- a joke about Tipshi, Tipshi. Right, Tipesh Esre. Bnei Esre, Tipesh Esre. Um, oh, they, they, they're they pretty smart. They just think differently. That's the thing. Anyway, um, 
<clears throat> so why is the difference there? Here, you can say, I can, the foot traffic bothers me, but you cannot say the hammer or the millstone or the children bother me. So first of all, can you tell me why, why is this uh, distinction between foot traffic and utensils that you use in the house? And who are, who are those children? Any idea? Well, the, the children might be students, possibly. So is he running a school? I open up a school. Okay. Yeah, could I open up a school? That's one possibility. I mean, I think the difference between foot traffic is, you know, it's very interesting. That word I key in is yotse. Yotse kelim yotse. So, you know, in other words, look, I don't care what you do in your house. It's your business. But once you create, you know, a area that's like Grand Central Station... It's not conducive to a residential area. Mm-hmm. I can't control what goes on inside your house. Right. If you've got people coming in and out. That's in my courtyard, too. Um, so we, we, there seems to be a distinction between being able to let someone make a living to a degree uh, and then possibly trying to prevent a lot of disturbance and, um, you know, how is the area, as we would say, how is it zoned? Is it zoned for residential or is it zoned for commercial? There's a lot of people who have cottage, you know, cottage industry businesses out of their houses. Right. They don't disturb the neighborhood in doing it. Right. That's interesting. Um, that's that's inter- That's an interesting distinction. I would want to show you, because you mentioned that, I'm going, I stopped sharing the screen because I have to share a different screen. Um, one second. Let's share this screen. Okay, so this would be the the shoot project. One second. This is the Barilan. I'm looking at um, the 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 Mishnah in the in the first chapter of Avatara, the previous chapter speaks about the case of partners who inherited or bought together uh, a a shared yard and now they want to divide it and build a division or a division or a wall uh, so here it specifies how to build it uh, what are the materials gvil kasid gazit kvisin levenin are those hewn stone unhewn stone uh, wooden uh, like a wooden fence bricks that we have to follow the the practice whatever is uh, whatever is the common practice um, and here it says en cholkin et hatzer ad shi ba arba amot lazeh ve arba amot lazeh you see this uh, uh, this section that you could only divide uh, a shared courtyard if you have enough uh, for both uh, for, for each one of them to have uh, at least one second I want to show you that uh, so uh, the let me, let me show you this in the Gemara so the Talmud speaks about it says what is the problem why do why would people want to to put the uh, the Mehita in the uh, uh, in the middle, and here. Okay, so this is it. A second, okay, so. Mm-hmm. Oh, here. So um, this is a different discussion where the uh, the Mishnah speaks about uh, what is called Hezekiah. The, the damage that can, that can be caused by eyesight. So they they bring an example. Halonot ben min ma'alan ben min matan or ben min kenegdan arba amot. That when you build a house next to your friend's house, that you have to make sure that your wall is not next to your uh, your friend's window, your neighbor's windows, not below the windows, not the. Uh, not below the windows, not above the windows, not uh, at least four feet between them. So first, not to block the light, but not also so you cannot look into your uh, into your neighbor's property. This is this is really a serious concern. Uh, so uh, then they speak about this situation. That there could be uh, a situation where one's roof 
is the next person, uh, the next person uh, courtyard. I mean, they are the, at the same level. People used to have flat roofs, so they would do uh, a lot of the things, a lot of the household activities would be done on the roof, either, you know, the laundry or drying fruits or stuff like that. Um, and if, they are, if, the, if the house are built on a slope or one house is taller than the other, then it could be that the one, uh, one person's roof is, the, is at the same level of the next uh, person's terrace uh, or, or, uh, or, or courtyard. So the, the owner of the roof is forced to build a division between his property and, uh, and his neighbor's property. Why? The, the person who has the courtyard can tell the person who works on his roof, he says, I always use the courtyard. It's easy. I mean, the courtyard is always a, uh, is a much more uh, common usage because you go in and out of the house, you bring your stuff there. But the roof is more random, you know, because you have to climb stairs to go upstairs and you, do, you have your own yard, you do whatever you need there. And he says, I don't know when, when are you going to go up for me to to hide myself from you, meaning that people used to do in their yard certain things that maybe they're not dressed properly, maybe they, uh, uh, you know, we, we, what is the, the, the maxim that we use re- regarding laundry outside? How, how do you say that? You, you don't have this as phrase in English? In Hebrew, you, when you want to say, like, you know, to spill the beans... To air your dirty laundry. Okay, so you you have that. Okay, in Hebrew it says that uh, uh, to, to wash your your dirty clothes outside, right? It's shameful. So this is like exposing the house secrets. Nobody should know what what your your clothes are soiled with or what clothes you have. So that was embarrassing. So this is, I think, uh, w- w- uh, this whole thing I wanted to show you uh, in connection to what Josh was speaking about. Um, and now go back to the uh, to the Mishnah in uh, in uh, Baba Batra, chapter two. I think that's a very important remark that here says the fact that people are going in and out bother me. So it doesn't matter that the person comes and claims it's because of the noise, because in reality, it's the foot traffic. It's the uh, it's the uh, constant stream of people coming in and out where you don't know whether you can have your privacy you got used to <clears throat> other people in your uh in your courtyard that might be uh breaching on your privacy but that's it's a, that's acceptable that's an acceptable inconvenience because that's how you live but you never sign on being disturbed by other people and um I know I've seen incidents like that in uh, in in buildings where you know someone opens a clinic or uh, a music teacher uh, receives students or stuff like that. That when you come, they ask you to be very very uh, considerate of the other residents because the little the the even the the smallest interaction or altercation between them could cause them to uh, to file lawsuit against them to close their business. I also. Um, actually visited a synagogue where uh, people who live just behind the synagogue but they have to go around and make a... They, they, but there is a shortcut in between the houses and the, uh, the, the person I stayed with told me that they used the shortcut which was through a back... Uh, the backyard of, uh, of one of the neighbors of the synagogue they use it for a while, but it only worked where when a non-Jewish family lived in the uh, in the house. But when a Jewish family moved in, they refused to let uh, people go through their courtyard to the uh, to the synagogue. And there were not that many people who walked on Shabbat through that, but still they wouldn't let them. Um, and now they have uh, again uh, they have another Jewish family, and that family is okay with it, but. But again, with the uh, you have to go with extreme caution and make sure that the door is locked and nothing is moved, nothing is changed, because it's understandable that you want 
you don't want to be constantly concerned of who is going by your window or who is going in your backyard. So I think this, going back to what Josh said, this is, could be a good, uh, uh, probably an illogical uh, argument here. So the Ose Kelim, Yotzeu Mocher Betoch Hashuk. But if I, if I live in that courtyard and I go, I go in in the morning with my, and I do my, uh, I, I make my, my utensils, then I go out and sell them and I'll come back. You can't tell me, I want you to have a type of, of job that either you're all day in your home office or all day in your in your business outside, but you cannot go back and forth. As a resident, you're allowed to go in and out as many times as you want, right? Um, right. So now, so that may be... I, I'm just thinking, I, I'm sorry to interrupt, I'm thinking none, about the implications. I mean, it, when, when um, you have this living arrangement where there are several private residences around the courtyard, it's a what I would consider a semi-private living arrangement, right. like an apartment or something like that. Uh, having the public come in and out, you know, treating one of the residences like a public store and having, or a public shop and having residents come in and out, um, make it almost like a public environment. And I wonder what effect that would have had on an Eru, right? If there was an Eru for the courtyard, you know, the residents right. themselves, uh, and now you start introducing the public into it. Does this create a public space? And now you've broken, you know, does everything become public at that point? I mean, right. There's implications. It's very interesting. Right. That's that's extremely right. This is going to be correct. Very interesting. It's uh, actually we, today we have, uh, I think, a global example of a situation like that, and that's Airbnb. Right? Because... Huh. I mean, that would be interesting to look at Airbnb from the point of view of uh, of uh, of Jewish law, right? Because what you're doing is that you're going, you're uh, you're renting, you're letting people sleep in your apartment for a certain payment. Now, uh, your neighbors could say, "Listen, I agreed to greeting you, Josh, every day uh, in the stair, you know, uh, in the hallway." But I don't want to see a stream of people every day, a different, a different person, strangers, even if they're vetted by uh, by the central headquarters of Airbnb. That could be an interesting argument. And uh, um, besides, you know, other arguments of that, they actually it's a, it becomes a rental, like uh, you turn your house in the hotel. But this is this is really the where it borders this whole halacha. It is. It is. Uh, it deals with damages that are not cannot be clearly defined. It's not as clear and evident as a uh, damage caused by fire, by heat, humidity, or or uh, um, heavy material, hazardous material by your wall. This is either the noise or the breach of uh, of privacy. But so he says, that one cannot claim. Says so if you're a blacksmith and you work in your in your uh, in your house, or if you're a miller and and you have the millstone in your house, your neighbors cannot uh, cannot condemn it. They cannot say that you must stop it because it uh, it causes too much noise. Which today I think. This is everything is in which we tr- we try to regulate everything. There's probably uh, you know for each municipality we know that there are uh, um, there is legislation that regulates the, the the amount of noise that is allowed within a residential building, right? So you could open, for example, if you're a dentist, you could you could have uh, you could have your clinic because the noise is not that that great. But if you're a uh, uh, I guess I don't know what what would be what we think that's not allowed because I'm thinking of New York City, where musicians have to rent an apartment in small quarters, and they play music all the time. So that would be um, maybe something that the uh, that the um, um, the building's board or someone will have to decide on. But definitely, we could say that as long yeah. as there there are no regulations in place, the uh, and someone is making noise in his apartment, the neighbors probably would, if they had to negotiate it, we could say there's a reasonable amount of noise that people can tolerate, and then there's something that's beyond that. Yeah, most of the ordinances have to do with the time allowed. 
It's allowed, you know, they restrict the time of the noise. Yeah. In Israel, it used to be between 2 and 4 in the afternoon. You cannot make noise. I think now it's more between 11 uh, or, you know, 11 p.m. and, 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 and 6 a.m. That, uh, you know, we, we, we live in a different pace. Everybody's a uh, faster. But I did have, I was uh, uh, woken up several times when I lived in Bogota by mariachis that uh, our neighbor, you know, was, was courting someone and he got, you know, or he, he, she was courted actually and her, and her boyfriend would bring mariachis under a window like at midnight. Real live, it was beautiful music, but not for it's not for midnight. Uh, uh, right. It's not uh, Ayn Klein and Nach music, you know. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, th- but then here we have like this really problematic phrase, Lomi Kolatino Kol, like you said, Josh, that it might be students. And then, but the problem is, and this is really how the Tom would end up interpreting it that uh, if you open a school, that you cannot, uh, the neighbors cannot complain. So, the one of two things. If if I go with with the uh, with the way you interpret the Mishnah, which I'm fine with, then it will be a question of the 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 author of the Mishnah tells us when when your neighbor complains about the noise, it's not really about the noise, but it's really it's more about privacy. I feel that I have no privacy when people come in and out. Therefore, if you make you, uh, you you make your production, you produce your utensils in the house, and you go sell them outside, I cannot complain that my privacy is being uh, is being uh, breached. The same way with the, with the hammer or with the millstone, and with the children, since there, if it's a school, the children come in at a set time and they leave at a set time, there would be no problem because there's not it's not an ongoing traffic. Uh, foot traffic all day long. The question is, why would there be an exception? Um, I mean, what, so, what, what are the children learning there? So, one interpretation in the Talmud, the actually the interpretation in the Talmud is there. We're talking about the Talmud Torah. We're talking about a religious school, and this is a halacha that has to do with the uh, with the importance of education. So that is that's a beautiful concept. The problem is it doesn't fit the Mishnah. Because if if the uh, tinokot here are exempt from regulations because it's a Talmud Torah, then the Mishnah should have divided it into a new section to say, Period. Right? And then to say, Ve'im haya melamed, right? Torah... Then they should have clarified that this is something that is specific to teaching Torah. Um, but what we gained from it is an amazing discussion in the Talmud about the whole system of public school and private schools, and when you hire or fire teachers, which we'll see uh, later, which is really very interesting sugya in the Gemara. But I think that the original meaning of the text was tinokot were the apprentices, the uh, the children would come to learn. Uh, a certain craft, and would so in that capacity, they are not residents of the of that specific courtyard or neighborhood, but they are allowed to come in. They come in, they uh, they go to their master, they learn with him, and then they leave at and in the evening or towards night, and then the uh, the neighbors cannot complain that uh, they're bothering them. Okay. Uh, any more comments about this? Uh, be, we'll see it later with more depth in the Talmud. So, so you're, you're, what you're saying in that last thing is that the you know codes are related to the Ose Kelit. Yes. Uh, in 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 terms of apprenticeship. Yes, and that it makes sense because the whole second part of the Mishnah. And then it makes sense in context. Right. Okay. It's all in context. Yeah. The problem is I'm 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 showing you this because the when besides learning business ethics, I want to see the methodology of analyzing Mishnah sources and Gemara sources, and we have to have in mind that the Talmud tried tried in many cases to force the Mishnah into a certain pattern that the Talmudic sages had in mind, and especially later on in the period of the Savoraim, which is between the Talmud and the Geonim, we have this anonymous work where they tried to reconcile 
uh, the uh, the statement of the Talmud with the uh, with the um, different systems that they knew from beforehand, and it's always uh, like in this case trying to interpret quality nokot as dealing with Talmud Torah <coughs> is really not the pshat of the Mishnah. Maybe it was part of the agenda of the of the commentators to uh, to speak about the importance of Talmud Torah. Anyway, so. Um, we already saw this Mishnah in the Gemara that I quoted before, that one uh, cannot build a wall next to a, his neighbor's wall. It has to have four feet of separation. And for the windows, you have to leave room uh, above, below, and uh, side to side. So I'll read Mishnah Hey. Marhikim et asulam. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so this again is Mishnah that teaches us interesting things about the realia of the of the Mishnah. Uh, let me first ex- explain a couple of words. So Sulam is a letter, also known as the uh, number one cause in uh, household accidents. Uh, Shovach is a birdhouse, but particularly here uh, a dove house. Where people would raise doves for either uh, people raise doves in Mishnaic times for three main purposes. One, I, I mean, I don't, I'm not necessarily saying them in the in the uh, the order of importance. One as messengers, as uh, to deliver messages. One was another uh, was for gambling. I mean, they had dove races, just like they have horse races. They had dove races. Uh, and the people who dealt with that were called Mafulhayoni, people who released doves. Um, and for food. You know, it sounds horrible today, but that uh, when, the, when, the, when the Mishnah and even the Torah speaks of eating fowl, they don't speak of chicken. Chicken was not that as common as doves at the time. Um, <clears throat> so... That is that is the, the word shovach. The word nemia. Nemia is a weasel, so it's a predator that would attack doves. Mazhila is from the verb zahal, to crawl, and uh, this is the Mishnaic word for the for what we call gutter. Even though the, in the modern Hebrew we use the word marzev, it's a uh, it's a I, it's a renovated or innovated word that combines two word mar uh, means a drop of water. Zav is dripping, but the 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 Mishnah word was mazhila because it makes the water sort of like crawl from the top of the roof all the way down. Uh, so zokef is to make to to put up, and the word sheger is interesting. Leshager in modern Hebrew is to send. Here, hence the word ambassador. Shagrir, Shagrir. Uh, it does appear in the Torah once, in the uh, the blessings in Parashat Kitavo. It says Shegar Alafecha, the uh, the the litter of the animals is called in Hebrew Shegar because the uh, uh, the 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 birth is sort of violent. Sometimes the the the, the newborn are being so almost being spat out, so it's called Shegar. But in this context, Shegar Ayuna means the 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 radius that a dove could fly. So what we speak here now about damages that concern uh, animals. So uh, 
if I if you have a if you have a birdhouse, my neighbor has a birdhouse, and I have a ladder that uh, that is next to the birdhouse that I use to 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 climb on my roof, I have to move the ladder four feet from the birdhouse uh, in order to uh, to prevent a weasel from climbing the ladder and jump into the uh, and jump leap uh, into the shovach. So this is my responsibility. So the, I'm saying that it's interesting because um, in this case there's no contact. The, all the other all the other uh, uh, physical damage that we spoke about before there was there was physical contact between the uh, the, the damaged objects and the damaging object, whether it was a well or a pit or, or the oven, all these things cause physical damage immediately, uh, immediate and direct. Here we talk about a potential danger that uh, one could say, listen, my letter is here, I didn't do anything, but it provides an, op- an opportunity for the weasel to uh, climb and jump into the shovach, into the uh, dove house, and it's my responsibility to prevent that. In the same manner, et akotel mina mazhila arba amot, meaning if my uh, my uh, roof has a gutter and I need to uh, I need to climb a ladder to to reach there and clean it, then you have to move your wall away from my gutter at least four feet, so I be I have room to put the ladder diagonally in a way that I could reach my my gutter. So uh, so this is a not not exactly related, but this is the way the Mishnah um, creates the mnemonic devices that connects things. Because here we spoke about keeping the letter away from the dove house, so we put another halacha that has to do with a letter that um, you have to make room for my letter to climb my wall. And here we go back to the doves. Marhikin etashovach minair hamishim ama. If you want to to start now a new business. Uh, as a dove raiser, it has to be at least fifty feet outside the city, because the birds, the the doves, could could be a hazard to people. They uh, uh, they fly into people's houses. They they could soil their uh, their the laundry that's outside. We all know uh, what can happen. Um, or they could also eat. They could cause damage to to crops, etc. So, the if you are starting now a new uh, dove house, it has to be fifty feet outside the city. It doesn't seem it doesn't seem such a great distance, right? Fifty feet outside the city, but you have to remember that the cities back then were much smaller than the cities that we uh, we think of today. Um, today, if you go fifty feet out of the city, you're still probably will end up in the middle of the highway, which is a very dangerous place. Uh, but we're talking about much, much smaller uh, scale. V'lo yase adam shovach betoch shelo, ela imken, yesh lo hamishim ama lechol ruach. One is not allowed to build uh, in his property, even if he has his own property outside the city, he has to have 50 feet, he has to have a radius of 50 feet, in all directions, so to make sure that his doves do not cause damage to other people around. Rabbi Yehuda Omer, Bet Arbaat Korin, Melo Sheger Ayona. Rabbi Yehuda is more strict, he says, 50 Yama is not enough, it needs to be Bet Arbaat Korin, meaning this is the the uh, the area needed to sow for Korim of, of wheat, which is uh, it's a quite larger area. But he says, Im But if you bought it from someone, and the dove house was already there, afilu betrova Even if it's a much smaller uh, radius, it is okay. Meaning, this is where we so like wander into the territory of what is called hazaka. Meaning that if a certain thing that is hazardous. Uh, has been in the same place for a while, and the neighbors did not complain. That means that they were that they acquiesced. The acquiescence of the neighbors is accepted as a uh, uh, as almost a proof of uh, of uh, ownership. So that goes back. The, the Talmud brings examples of a building an oven 
or smoking something next to your to your property. So let's say in the case of we mentioned before about uh, smoking, you Josh spoke about smoking a cigarette, <clears throat> but we also spoke about smoking meat. So let's say um, I'm not only smoking meat, I'm, uh, you know, once in a while, but I make it my business to curate and smoke meat or fish or whatever. And now, when the, when when my neighbor walks into his house, he feels that he lives in a uh, in a, in a smoked meat facility, and he's not happy with that. So now he comes and complains. So if he if he complained, and when I just started it, his complaint is valid. But after a while, which is defined in the Talmud, we tell him you should have complained earlier by not complaining within the three, the first three. It's almost like a return policy. If you wanted to return it, you had to return it earlier. So if you want to complain, you have to voice your concern earlier. The moment you didn't do it. We understand that you are okay with it. Um, so, but all this is true when the person who started the business or the hazard lives there and the neighbor is complaining. But if someone started something that might be seen as hazardous, or like in this case, uh, a dove house with a very small radius around it, and he sold it to someone else, and the and the neighbors did not complain when the first owner had it. Now it's already established for the second owner, meaning he he got it's a deed, it's it's a done deal, and nobody can complain. Okay, um, still in the dove business, we uh, we mention a halakha that is really not related at all to the damages of neighbors, but it's a famous one because it caused a rabbi, Barabi Yirmiya, to be kicked out of of class. I, have you ever heard of Yirmiya? The rebellious student? Um, so what happened with him is that they were studying this Mishnah, and they spoke about a fledgling which fell out of the nest, out of the birdhouse, and uh, was found within 50 feet of the dove house. So if he was found within the radius, it belongs to the owner of the dove house because it obviously came from there. But if it was found outside the radius of the 50 amot, it belongs to the founder, uh, to the finder. But if it was found between two dove houses, uh, So it says if uh, if the uh, uh, this fledgling this lost fledging, the poor fledging, was found between two dove houses, then we measure which one is closer. Uh, if if it's closer to one, then this one gets it. If it's mehza al mehza, meaning it's the exact same distance uh, from both, then they have to split, to sell it and split the uh, uh, the uh, the money. Rabbi Yirmiya, in the Talmud, asked the question regarding the first part of the Mishnah. You said that within the fifty yama, it belongs to the owner of the dove, of the dove house, and with outside outside the fifty amot, um, it belongs to the uh, to the finder. He says, "What happens if one leg is in the radius and the second leg is outside the radius?" So, what would you say to a question like that? You ha- we said that you know it's like say, you know, we know that uh, uh, the the assumption is that a bird, a, a fledgling, would not wander if it cannot fly, would not wander beyond fifty feet of the of the dove house. It has this inside uh, autom- uh, you know GPS installed. So what would be the answer? What so are they? Are they- suspecting anything in this case then that uh, the the finder basically set it there 
Uh, if I would if I would have wanted to make a pun, I would say that are they suspecting foul play? But uh, ah, yes. uh, I know, terrible. No, just, but, uh, but based on the mission itself, if a, a foot was in the fifty and out there, wouldn't that be mechetza on mechetza, and they just split it? No, the mechetza on mechetza is between between two uh, uh, dove houses. Oh. Oh, okay. Oh, so, if, if, I, if somebody, but there's no other dove house around, and I'm, I find it. Right. So the, the question, so the question of Rimiya is, it, it cannot be answered by the second part because it's, it, he wants to know whether the values, the numeric values given by the by the Mishnah, are absolute or not. Why? Because, but in the second part, you assume that. Uh, I mean, for the whole Mishnah, you assume that a, uh, that a fledgling would never wonder. More than fifty ama. So, if this is the case, if it was found in the radius, it belongs to you. If it's out of the radius, it's the finders. If it's between two two dove houses, then I could say it's not. Uh, it's and it's mehta al mehta, meaning it's exactly the same distance. We say even if that distance is exactly the fifty, you know, uh, this is what Abiyah asks. Now, what if the uh, the the fledging past the fifty uh, feet radius and put one leg outside. Uh, if you say that the the values are absolute, that means that it is impossible for a fledgling to cross that line. It would never cross that line, so it's impossible that it came from this dove house. So where did it come from? It must have come. From and we don't have any other dove house in the area within the fifty amot, so we must say we must say that someone dropped it, that it was in a basket and it fell. And if that is the case, it belongs to the finder, the rabbi, who's uh, the I mean the, the master of Rabbi Yirmiyah, who was asked this question, kicked Rabbi Yirmiyah out of the uh, uh, out of the Beit midrash because he felt that all he wants is just to uh, to tease, to ask impossible questions. This is how. Uh, the commentators explained that he said, if if we said that a fledging cannot go beyond 50 amot, cannot go beyond 50 amot, and meaning your question is impossible. But I think that if he got upset, is what it was because that question is uh, is really unnecessary. Because once you said you drew a line, right, there could always be doubts. But at a certain point in, in halacha, you have to make uh, you have to you have to draw a line to say. Uh, right. If someone, for example, you say you could have your permit, or you could you could be a driver when you turn twenty, right? So we will say you turn twenty at midnight. That we have to make this uh, uh, this deadline. Otherwise, we always uh, there are certain things that we we cannot afford to be in the in the twilight zone. So the same thing in this case, uh, the master would tell Birmia. We said that the uh, fledgling cannot go beyond fifty amot. And therefore, if one leg is outside the 50 Yama, that means that it came from a different source and it did not came from the Dove House. Anyway, this was not related, really, in terms of the Mishnah, not related to the damages of, of neighbors. But again, again, another example of how the Mishnah goes with the mnemonic device. I started talking, we started talking about the laws of doves, right? How far your, your the, little, the letter from the Dove House, your Dove House from the city, if you bought a Dove House, so, since we spoke about that, we segue to speak about other laws of uh, of doves and uh, and ownership, and um, in the next couple of mishnayot, which we'll do that next week or in two weeks from now, we'll look at the uh, at damages that we could define as ecological damage. This is one of the uh, one of the uh, we could say key sources in the Tom in the Mishnah to show that uh, the the rabbis of the Mishnah did care about uh, ecology. So. I think that will be all for today.